and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of pH worth up to $9.99 using the code OxygenAddict. We're also brought to you by FoodCell.co.uk. The next generation of top tube nutritional carriers for your bike designed to allow endurance triathletes and cyclists to carry enough food and gels while allowing easy access. Check it out at foodcell.co.uk. And we're also brought to you by teamoxygenatic.com triathlon coaching. Helping hundreds of age group triathletes see huge improvements in their 70.3 and Ironman performances. The time training system makes sure you get the important training done each week in a way that complements the rest of your life. All right, everyone. Welcome to the show. This week, we've got an interview with Denmark's Hella Fredriksson. And we're also going to be looking back over some races, including the 70.3 World Champs in Nice. Quick shout out to sponsors foodcell.co.uk. The food cell health has been reduced in price by £5 down to 39 99 And I think it is. I had it on my bike the other day when I went out. I've got the old spares kit on the top tube for the time trial. I think it's a great solution for carrying a spares kit on your time trial bike. You can get spare tube in there, a couple of CO2s, an inflator, tire levers, the whole deal. And it tucks away beautifully out of the wind. That's not what it's designed for, though. It's designed for carrying food and gels and stuff like that. So you can get four gels in or two big pieces of flapjack. It attaches really securely to the top tube of your bike with Allen key bolts if you've got them or Velcros if not. And I really love it. You can get it open with one hand and closed with one hand so you can get your food and gels out as you're riding as well, which I never managed to do with my old top tube nutritional carrier. So these things are awesome. You can get over and check them out at foodcell.co.uk. I've lent mine to someone, Rob, for Outlaw X. Have you? Yep. There's yep, going to be yep. a lot of them around. They're going to be down at Outlaw X. They're one of the sponsors of the event. So you'll be able to get over and see them. They've They've had historically special offers on at Outlaw X. So there's a couple of weeks to go to that. Get over to the food cell stand there um, and pick yourself one up on race day if you've not ordered one beforehand. I think it's one of the few bits of kit actually that people say don't try something new on race day, but get that on there and it's it's a great way to carry the food if you haven't got it sorted already. Hells, what a weekend it was for racing. I was what? Uh, it was awesome, wasn't it? It was great. It was it was really exciting. And there was so much talk about what was going to happen. And I personally don't think that the races let us down. No, not at all. It was. Uh, well, let's kick off. Let's talk about the men's race to start with. I watched it on the turbo, Helen. I was all inspired. As I know, lots of other people were reading comments on Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter. People sitting and pedaling away and putting out far too much power than they meant to, getting all excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's like live Swift. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. With the climb that. and everything, but yeah. even better. <laughs> it was it was pretty awesome. So men's race, the first thing that was noticeable for me was just how close that lead men's pack was. I was expecting Joss Amberger to be well off the front, but he got, what was it, two seconds on a big yeah. pack? So not much in it at all, which, again, we'll come back to this later, but it brings up some interesting questions for how that's going to affect the swim at Kona coming up. Um, but there was a pack of about, I don't know what you reckon, 10, 12, got out the water all together. Ali Brownlee like amongst IT, them. It? Yeah, it was. It, and they came out of the water looking like, a long distance ITU race. That was the thing that really struck me. It it looked like there was significant pace increase in the speed people were running from the water to get to the bikes at. It was absolutely yes, full on, bit. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then similarly on the bike, it looked like an ITU race straight out of transition as well. Ali Brownlee lost absolutely no time in just putting the hammer down and he put his intentions out clearly, didn't he? I'm going to try and get away and I'm going to try and... Mm just zoom off down um yep. and that was even before we got to any of the hills so i was thinking you know what 10k in hills i thought well this is it he's got this wrapped up it's game yep, over. wrapped up yep everyone's racing for second um but wasn't to be we had rudy von berg and we had gustav eden bridged up to him on the descent and i think that was the interesting thing for me we didn't quite get to see them catching him on the descent 
until they actually caught him and the speed that these guys were descending at. Now, Ali Brownlee's already one of the best bike handlers in the world and that showed in the speed he was going down those descents at. But the other two of them, I think, were even more impressive than he was. I, I didn't see that bit of the bike, Rob. Um, Did you not? I didn't, no, because so, I was out running. But Ah, I um, got you. Well, it was just like all of a sudden, whew, past one of them came and then I've forgotten which one bridged up first. I think it was... I think it was Von Berg bridged up first and he came past Ali Brownlee like he was launching a rocket. And there was almost like a double take from Ali Brownlee as he came by. Because, you know, they were already travelling at God knows what speed going down those those fast descents down the, down the mountain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, really impressive. The three of them rode together all the way to the finish. And, yep. and actually, Rudy Von Berg and Ali Brownlee got into transition kind of sat down and put the shoes on and the commentators were talking about like are they going to put socks on or not and as they were talking yeah. about this Eden was gone he was gone it was, yeah, was that like, was the bit I did see and I yeah. was like wow that is that is the transition that you want isn't it so he already had sort of 10 seconds on him didn't he it was it was so quick that I thought he was going for a seat further down through transition but he was already gone and yeah a lot of the a lot of the written reviews of the races on different websites kind of missed this or hadn't seen it live because Gustav Eden had I don't know in terms of time it probably wasn't much but like you said five or ten seconds but in terms of space on the road yeah. there was a definite gap it was yeah 50 yeah. 60 I know, 80 that. meters wasn't it to Von Bergen yeah. and then the same to Ali Brownlee yeah but Ali Brownlee was still undoing his helmet yeah. when Eden was off yeah and, and I, I wonder how much of that played out into the fact that I mean, they were they must have been running fast because Eden was running like 309 pace the whole way average. So for Ali Brownlee to catch him and pass him, he must have been running sub three minute Ks for the first two, three, four K. Mm-hmm. Which is nuts, isn't it? In a 70.3. Oh, yeah. And I did wonder it, later on crazy. how much of that like came back. Did that come back to, to sort of pay him back later on? And maybe Eden just kind of held a steady pace. I'm saying steady. Yeah, I know. The same <laughs> pace. <laughs> yeah. But didn't have the the sort of bursts, you mean? Didn't have to have that surge of because let's yeah. not forget, if you're trying to if you're trying to catch twenty seconds like Ali Brownlee did, or fifteen seconds even over two or three K, and you're already running probably close to three minute Ks, that's a significant gap, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean you look at the run splits at the end though, you know, Eden did a one oh eight. Just and, incredible, and Brownie isn't it? did a yeah. So one oh eight ten, and then Brownie did a one ten forty three. Yeah. Um. But even in their styles, like Eden just looked, he did look so in control. Did not he the whole way? Yeah. Didn't he? And he looked so relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. Relaxed. Yeah. And it was, it was an incredible performance, and. And I know he had he had the form from was it it was one of the Middle East races he finished second that wasn't he to qualify yeah earlier um, at the end of last year wasn't it was it Bahrain maybe I can't remember end which one it was year. exactly yeah. but yeah. he went super super fast on debut but then everyone had just forgotten about him well then he would have obviously concentrated on the ITU totally. and you know he he finished fourth <laughs> last week, last week yeah. in Lausanne yeah um, so he he just missed out on the podium there and. You know, he's sort of one of the trio of Norwegians who had that clean sweep um, in Bermuda the other year. Yeah. And so he's, I guess he kind of came in completely under the radar, didn't he? Really, yeah. for most people. Yeah. And so, then we also had, we shouldn't we shouldn't leave out your favourite really Norwegian, should we? Oh, Christian Blumenfeld, <laughs> who came home in fourth. Who came home in fourth, yeah. So again... What a brilliant set of results for the two Norwegians on the back of... We've often said, haven't we, that 70.3 racing is more like ITU than it is like Ironman distance. And I think that was showed. If the guys are super fit for ITU racing, they're also super fit for 70.3 racing. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And it, it, and and Rudy von Berg as well, Rob. He's had an incredible season this year, hasn't he? Yeah. And so it's a fantastic result for him to uh, three fifty six. He finished in. Yeah. Um, so what a minute behind uh, Ali Brownlee. And it's a shame, isn't it, that it that kind of gets overlooked. He was absolutely delighted yeah. with his with his third place to get on the podium. His brilliance. 
And what was that thing you sent me about his family? His whole oh, bunch yeah. of amazing, so, wasn't there? There was a whole bunch. So um his so his dad, um Rudolf von Berg, he was he was racing, I think his brother uh, Max was racing, and then his sister was also racing. Oh, which is brilliant. so four of them all at the world champs. It's amazing, they clearly have it? some very good genes going on there. They do, don't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's also um, worth and, giving and a shout out to, sorry to interrupt you, but Gustav Eden riding a road bike rather than a time trial bike. And yeah. People were debating the, you know, the merits of the road bike against the time trial bike on that course. And it turns out the reason he's riding a road bike is because he hasn't actually got a time trial bike. So come on, yeah. sponsors, step up. Get him one. <laughs> but, but again, though, what, what's interesting about that in some of the interviews, do you remember, I think the first one that we did with David McNamee was saying that, you know, didn't he borrow Mario Mola's bike? That's right. Or, yeah. Yeah. And, he didn't have one, uh, did he either? No. And a lot of them wouldn't because they don't need one. Yeah. Um, and then Christian Blumenfeld, I heard he was saying that he had got his time trial bike or he had been fitted onto it. I mean, on Monday. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Well, so, let's look down the let's look down the results a little bit as well, because interestingly, I think one of the results that's going to get overlooked here, unless we're careful, is Sebi Keenley finishing in fifth. Yeah. He had an absolute shocker of a swim, didn't he? He was four minutes down out of the water. Yeah. So I think already he was in forty fifth place. So just the worst case scenario for him non-wetsuit swim but I mean he's not usually that far down at Kona even is he so whether he had some kind of issue um to be so far down is really unusual but then he managed to bike a very similar split to the lead guys and run a 109.30 so he's outrun early Brownlee by a minute and 15 so I think it was the second fastest run of the day so he ran away from Javier Gomez that's an amazing performance for someone who's biked on their own through the field to get to that position, isn't it? Yeah, you just hope that, you know, he there's, there's still, he can, you know, when it comes to Kona, he can put together a good performance there and he hasn't, you know, dented any sort of Hawaii hopes um, there. Well, I think it'll be the opposite for him, you know, I think he'll get massive confidence from that because obviously yeah, something so. weird happened in the water. It's not usual for him to be so far down and it's it's almost certainly not fitness related that. But to run one oh nine thirty, especially as people look at him as a people look at him as a bike specialist who can run a bit, but he's outrun Ali Brownlee by a minute and fifteen over the high. Like that's an incredible performance, isn't it? To put the the second fastest run of the day in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome stuff. It was someone who didn't have the race that they uh, that they would have hoped for. Patrick Lang, he he was competing, and he said, "Well, that displayed my current weakness on a day that didn't work out the way I wanted it to. The field was exceptionally strong with a big amount of short distance triathletes and fast sportsmen. I'm not using that as an excuse." Um, and he says, you know, other long distance triathletes were able to deliver an excellent performance. Now it's five more weeks till Kona and I'm looking forward to delivering a different performance there. So, yeah. you know, perhaps the opposite for him um, in terms of confidence. That would really not have been a confidence boost. Uh, the women's Can't race, Can't write Rob. him off though, can we yet? No, 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 no. a no, long no. way to go. So, and one final shout out as well. In 13th place, George Goodwin. Young George Goodwin from Great Britain. Um, got himself up into 13th so nice work George awesome. ladies race yeah did you watch much of this one because again I was out running for some of it I I didn't catch it with it until they were actually on the run and by that point it looked like looked like it was all sewn up it looked okay. like the racing was over at that point didn't it pretty much so I saw them coming, again, coming out of the swim and then the beginning bit of the bike and you're thinking, oh my goodness. And obviously Lucy Ann Charles came out of the water first and then once that, you know, she had sort of like free reign in a way at the beginning bit of the bike course because yeah. she could take all the lines that she wanted. There wasn't that congestion as there was a little bit behind her where, you know, they had to do sort of bits of sitting up and things like that. But then they... I say they, you know, Daniela Reef, Holly Lawrence soon called into that lead. And then you should, you could have seen when Daniela Reef got on the bike and was sort of flying past people 
almost just like it look it looks like she's going past you know twice as fast and you can sort of see them look up like you were saying with uh, brownie um on the on the descent from the from the men's race and you sort of look to the left and you can see oh my goodness she's well, it looks like that's past. Where, where she did the damage isn't it i mean mm. the interesting thing for me was holly lawrence put 30 seconds into Daniela Reef. They got out of the water together and she put 30 seconds into her in transition. Yeah. And cut and I think she did the fastest T1 of the day by a mile mm -hmm. because she she ate into Lucy Charles's I think she took 20 seconds out of Lucy Charles's yep. minute in transition, which yep. is good going. Yeah. Um and then it all came together on the climb, didn't it? At some point Lucy Charles got popped for drafting, which yes. Now I I've like I didn't see it live and I went back to try and watch it on the you know the, the replay bit and there wasn't much by way of replays on Iron Man Live, Iron Man Now. No. No. Um there was a lot of comments about people riding too close, but I don't want to read into that too much because as I watched the men's race on the bike, people were saying, you know, these guys were all drafting because the camera angle that they were showing it from made it look like they were really close and it was only when you got the overhead shot that they were clearly the men's lead three were clearly 20 meters plus apart but looked yeah. much closer so i'm always wary of people sort of saying you know they were clearly clearly drafting mm -hmm. so whatever happened to lucy charles she's she's got very unlucky to be too close and to get caught for drafting i think because i don't think it's a case of sitting on the wheel i think it's a case no. of being eight meters rather than 12 yeah yeah and so she got a four minute penalty five i think um, actually you know Oh, I read somewhere four, but maybe five. Yeah, that would have, yeah. five would kind of make more sense. When I read yeah. four, I was like, mm. but um, I think it yeah, was five, five minutes. So, and she ended up. Te this was the interesting thing for me. She took the penalty pretty soon after she got it. So she ended up riding a lot of the ride on her own. Whereas mm. if she'd taken it in the penalty tent that was right at the end of the bike leg, she would have had the benefit of riding with everybody else. And and that kind of pack ride thing, which might have changed the dynamic. I don't know. I don't know. Do not know. Yeah. Um, regardless, Daniela Reef just yes, regardless Daniela Reef getting that. a fifth seventy point three world title, which it's just insane, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. She rode away from everyone on descent, and then yep. she was the strongest runner. Holly Lawrence, to give her a due, really went for it over the first five k. I think she clawed back thirty or forty seconds on Daniela Reef in the first five k, and then obviously it didn't happen for her and, and she's ended up two and a half minutes or two minutes slower than Daniela Reef. So good for her for really giving it some and chasing it down because she was absolutely wrecked when she crossed the finish line. Yeah. Yeah. And she was, she was, Holly Lawrence was, you know, in the interviews after she was just so chuffed with how she had finished. Cause what in the interview that you did with her a couple of months ago, she was saying that pretty much doctors had said she'd never, you know, she'll never run again. Yeah when she was in the really darkest bits of her injury. So then to come back from that and to put up a, you know, they really were pushing each other, weren't they? Yeah. So to come away the second, I think she was delighted. And then Imogen Simmons, who now represents Switzerland, she did for a while represent Great Britain. She did, and yeah. Definitely. She was one of the ones who we had on our ones to watch what two years ago now three years yeah, ago another one of helen's another one of helen's top I tell you what pros if you're listening and helen tips you you've got a bright future in front of you <laughs> <laughs> so i mean she had a, she had an incredible performance as well and she said afterwards that i mean again i think she was pretty gobsmacked to to finish in third i'm sure when you go into these things you go in thinking you know, I can win or, you know, I can be right up there. Yeah. If, uh, you know, let's say most of them will probably think, right, well, Danielle's got this. But other than that, you'd think, right, well, or else what's the point in going kind of thing? Yeah. What's, you know, what's the point in racing? But I still think she was pretty shocked to finish where she finished as well. Um, yeah. And then Chelsea Sodaro, she had a great run. And I think it was only her, like, her fourth pro race or something like that. Crazy. Yeah. 117.56 uh, on the yeah, run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. she had a 117. I think Emma Pallant had a 117. And Sara Svensk of Sweden had a 117 run as well. So, yeah, really superb running. Emma Pallant looked completely, completely spent at the finish line. And then India Lee, who we had on the show just the other day, she finished in 11th, which is absolutely great. And 
Kat Rye, who we had on, who should have been going, by all accounts, as an age grouper, but qualified early this year and switched to pro, didn't she, in yeah. May? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She finished, now I think she was 16th, but she might have been 15th, but again, really great performance. Great stuff. I really hope that we can convince Holly Lawrence to step up to Ironman. She's going to. She's going to. Excellent. Uh, I like again, to think you... our interview with her played part of that. So I'm going <laughs> well... to say again, Holly, I don't think you can do it just to go there into doing it because there's someone who's really going to be in and amongst the mix in Kona who can really, you know, swim and bike possibly with Daniela Reef at that same sort of level and add another, you know, another thing into the equation there. It's the more competition we can get at the front of that ladies race, the better. Yeah. Yeah. She did say that I think Iron Man is on the cards for next year. Excellent. So there we go. Good. It looks like we managed to goad her into it. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Other races then. Oh, before we do that, just a quick shout out. Hell's if I may a bit indulgent this, but I had four people racing that I coach. So I want to give a shout out to Team OA members, Yuri, Chris, Richard and Lynette who all had great races and did themselves proud. So well done to all of you. Hi. Next up, the Otil O, I've not said it right, have I? The Otil O Utilil. World Championships, Swim Run World Championships in Sweden, the original race that's now the World Championships, took place this weekend as well. Oh uh, Yeah, earlier like last week. Was I it think last it weekend? Monday, yeah, 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 yeah. There yeah. we go. Monday. So amazing photos over on Slow Twitch, if people haven't seen it, it looks like an incredible event that they've managed to, you know, and it deserves to. I had a mate of mine who was a great swim runner who did this event about a decade ago, and he came back from it raving and saying, you've got to go. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, it sounds awesome, but it's a kind of a, you know, little niche event kind of thing. And to see the way it's grown is mm. is amazing. So, go on, sorry. No, it's just in the, really in the last, what, I'd say two, three years, yeah. swim run has just... It's exploded. Yeah, it really, really has. Um, so wins here for Pontus Lindberg and George Bielkamo from Sweden in the men's race. Shal Eriksson and Simon Bjorsson in the mixed race. And go on, Hells, you can have this one. Thanks. Fanny Dankwa and Desiree Anderson in the women's race. Cool stuff. Now, I had a quick look through the results and it looked like Andy Blow... And his partner, now where did I find this before? Andy Blow and his partner, James Phillips, finished in 16th, which is good going. Blooming yeah, awesome performance. Yeah, now, we'll say this here, Hells. I'm hoping to arrange a quick catch up with Andy Blow later on today. If I manage to get it, this is where I'm going to insert it into the show. Andy Blow, welcome back to the show. It's lovely to talk to you. Joining us from sunny Nice the day after the World Championship 70.3s, where I believe you've been very busy on the back of racing Otelo in Sweden a week before that. You must be absolutely goosed, my friend. Yeah, feeling it a bit, actually. I wish I was still in sunny Nice, mate, but I'm back in not-so-sunny Christchurch Dorset this morning. Really? Um, You're back, been, back home already? Yeah, flew home at the weekend to um, spend wow. some time with the, with the kids um, and my wife, so... Yeah, but but had a great time out there, actually. Good stuff. Hey, so listen, tell us about Otelo. Congratulations, first of all, on you and your partner finishing 16th place overall. And it looked like you were just a couple of seconds outside the nine-hour barrier as well. You must have been tempted for a sprint finish or not so we, much? Well, you know, Rob, you've been there enough times, mate. When you've been on your feet for nine hours, it's, it's hard to muster a sprint. I actually <laughs> yeah. do wonder if there would have been one in there, but unfortunately there was no finish line clock facing as we came oh, up the hill no. to the finish. So the, the <laughs> spectators, the other side were all shouting really loud because they could see the finish clock and that we were just coming up to nine hours. We thought they were just cheering and getting in the, in the mood. And when, when we crossed the line, there was a sort of an, ah, uh, you know, I won't say the word, but you know, I think, you know, what I'm thinking moment when I turned around and realized we missed it by about three, four seconds, because oh, in a man. in a long day, you always think, well, there must be three or four seconds out there, and I'm sure there was. But you know, yeah. to be honest, we we were just really happy with our, you know, we had a solid, solid performance for for two blokes that you know aren't training too seriously. So that was that was quite good. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. So talk us through the day. There's something like 10k of swimming, is that right? And 40k of running. Am I in the right ballpark? 
with the swimming you are it's about 10k of yeah just 10 or 11k of swimming i think it's more like 65k's of running Is it's it a long really? so wow. it's a lot of running yeah and how many different uh, sets of islands do you go across then i think it's upwards of 50 transitions it might even be 70 it's wow. a lot it's a lot of changeovers so you have to be pretty quick in and out of the water as well as trying to be quick swimming and running and from the pictures I've seen, it's it's not easy getting in and out of the water either, is it? There's a lot of scrambling over rocks and Yeah, there's a one bit where you're semi sort of abseiling down a rope, you know, you're not clipped in, it's not that steep, but you're pulling yourself down a rope or you're trying to climb out on slippery rocks and it rained the night before the race this time. Whereas the past two times I've done it, it's been dry. The the surface was everywhere was wet and it was like ice skating some of the time. It was actually hilarious, you know, trying to even just stand up on some of the rocks. <laughs> So how was your experience of the race overall then? Is it is it like a mass start where you have some kind of idea where you are in the field all the way through? Yes, it is. It's a mass start. So you all start with a short run, which is largely controlled behind a quad bike for about a mile. Then you hit the first swim, which is actually the longest swim of the day. So you've got basically sort of three, four hundred people all hitting this swim essentially together and a lot of testosterone, a lot of you know, yeah. it's, it's and everyone's got shoes and hand paddles on and most people are tied to their partner. So if you can imagine like being in the start of an Ironman swim, but with with those added f- features and benefits, it's quite, <laughs> quite punchy. I've done it before, though. So James, who I was racing with and I, I sort of said to him, look, I'd lead the first swim. And we, we largely stayed out of trouble. We sat just off to the right hand side of the main group and, and managed to sort of tag along. I think we came out the first swim in about. Um, you know just just between 25th and 30th something like that which was about where we you know we were happy to do that with a nice easy controlled swim and then then the plan was to move forwards throughout the day which largely we did we we got up to I think at one point we had a good middle section in the race where we got up to about 10th or 11th and we really started to believe that a top 10 might be on the cards but then then the lack of mileage told a little bit for me on the long run and we we slipped a few places to 16th but we were you know we were totally chuffed with that that was as good a day as we could have hoped to have had i think yeah wow amazing and i'd imagine like the thing i've always wondered with this is how how uncomfortable is it running in a wetsuit especially when you're covering 65 kilometers yeah it can be it's, it is if it's hot luckily the weather was warm but not too hot on this one and the new wetsuits we were using wetsuits made by a company called arc who are a Swedish brand who actually just make them only for swim run. And they're very, very thin and flexible. And compared on my previous experiences of running in an old triathlon wetsuit, then it's like night and day. So yeah. it, is, it is getting easier. What that, of course, means is you're a little bit more exposed to the cold in some of the long swims. So there's a bit of a trade-off. But it, it is it is not not all that comfortable. One of the worst yeah. things for me as well is, is swimming, is, sorry, is running in a fairly thin pair of shoes because as I'm – getting older my knees sort of feel it a bit more and i was running in very very sort of wafer thin innovate running shoes which are great for the swimming because they're light and and they don't catch too much water and they're really grippy on the rocks but but when you're sort of smashing out 20k run in the middle of this race with those on it really my feet are still sore now a week later yeah i can believe that and i'd imagine as for a guy like you with like your history of trying to keep on top of your your electrolyte balance Running in a wetsuit is probably like the situation that's designed to make you sweat the most in the whole world. Yeah, it, it is, yeah. And also, you, you throw in the fact there's limited aid stations because you're, you know, sometimes course, you go over yeah. well over an hour between aid stations, um, and you, they don't supply cups. You have to carry your own soft flask to fill up your drinks and whatnot. What I ended up doing was I ended up filling up a 500 ml soft flask at most of the aid stations and drinking that, and maybe carrying a bit more forward with me while we're running and I was taking a, a whole ton of, uh, you know, sweat salt um, capsules, salt, salt capsules to keep myself topped up. Luckily I didn't, I didn't get any cramps all day. I felt a few little tight hamstring moments when they could have gone, but managed to stay on top of it. Um, so it was good. One thing we've actually done as part of a scientific study, we, we weighed ourselves before and after the event we also recorded what we intended to eat and drink and what we actually ate and drank okay and that's all going to be analyzed for the sort of micro and macronutrient profile the amount of fluid we took on and, and whatnot and then hopefully get get written up and we'll certainly write it up as a blog on our website in the coming weeks i hope nice oh that'd be that'd be interesting i think for people to read andy that's really good so watch out for uh, that blog over at precision hydration coming to you all soon hey 
Yes, indeed. So then straight off the back of that, you've zoomed over to Nice for the 70.3 World Championships. Uh, and I saw on Facebook you were involved in a really cool Q&A. It was brilliant. It was um, organised by Matt and the, his team at Purple Patch. And they're a fantastic group of, of people. And they invited, first of all, they invited me to, to jump in with Matt because he was doing a live sort of um, last 24 48 hours before the race pep talk for athletes and and answer any questions and things like that and that was a great honor in itself to to be asked to do that alongside matt and then a couple of days later he told me oh we've also got mark allen joining the the panel as well and that was unbelievable really and amazing yeah really really good to have a legend like that someone who is genuinely one of my heroes when i was doing triathlon in the in the late 1990s early 2000s towards the end of his career yeah, it was. Yeah, it was really special actually to be able to chat with him and listen to what he had to say. And he was the king of Nice as well, wasn't he? Back in the day, did he win that ten times when it was the Nice Long Course yeah. Championships? Ten times, including beating Simon Lessing, I think, in his last attempt. Yeah, you know, in, in his final year, and he told a great story about that on the when we did the when we did the sort of um, the, the Facebook Live thing where he was saying that because Simon just beat him off the bike, but wasn't sure he'd never run 20 miles before and he wasn't sure how to pace it. So he kind of stood and waited for Mark in transition and they set off on the run together and he just locked in behind him and Mark had to physically stop on the promenade at points to make him come by and do some work. Really? Yeah. Wow. And then he said, he, he, and he told a great story as well about how he reckons he, he dropped him at the end and he said with about 5k to go, he thought, I'm not going to out sprint this guy. So, I've got to turn up the the power ever so slowly and just make him not realise you're going faster, but make him just feel like he's hurting in his own head. And he did that and he gradually gapped him and ran away. Oh, he's an interesting guy, isn't he, Mark? We've had him on the show a couple of times and he's the mental aspect of the racing. I think he, he mastered as well as anybody, if not better than anybody. Yeah, very much so. Good stuff. Right, well, so listen, are you tempted to do Otolo again in the future? That's three times in the bag. Is that is that the itch scratch now, or are you tempted to go back for more? I, th- I, th- I think it is for the big race, certainly for the time being, because it's a huge commitment in time and effort to do that. And I've loved it every time, you know, genuinely. But um, I think I'll probably do some of the shorter races. The, the ones that last sort of four or five hours are very, very much more manageable and, yeah. uh, on, on the level of training I can do. So I did say never again last year, having done it, and then ended up towing the line again this year. But I can almost categorically say it won't be if it happens it won't be next year let's put it that way <laughs> right we'll tune in next year to see if that comes true or not <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah all right andy thanks very much for your time mate no worries good to chat to you rob cheers mate all right then and other results that we've seen hells are 70.3 sunshine coast yep Braden curry and hannah wells taking the wins there and then it was iron man wisconsin as well at the weekend and uh, Lindsay corbin uh, took out the women's race there cool stuff all right let's jump over into this week's interview of the week tell us about this please hells so this week's interview is with hella frederickson who is from denmark um she recently announced her retirement after an 11 year professional career she went to the olympics at london 2012 doing itu she's from a swimming background and then after london she would have switched to 70.3 and in 2014 the very beginning of 2015 she was pretty much invincible she was winning everything she won high v um she got the fastest ever 70.3 time in three hours and 55 um she did step up to ironman as well she finished in kona last year 16th and she was going to be racing at ironman copenhagen this year but injury put pay to that um but yeah it's a really good interview and i think lessons for us all stuff that we can all relate to so here is this week's interview of the week hello frederickson hello and welcome to the oxygen addict triathlon podcast how are you and how is life as a retired professional athlete? Hi, thank you for having me. Well, um, I'm pretty good. I'm, uh, I'm uh, kind of enjoying life in a different way. Um, I have always enjoyed life, but now I have time to enjoy um, having more time, being less tired and also being able to use my, uh, my brain a little more, not being tired all the time. <laughs> Had you known for a while that 
you were going to have to call it a day? Well, yeah, I, I've always wanted to um, plan when I wanted to step away and not be forced to step away. And I've always kind of promised myself to stop when I was still at the top and still able to uh, do or have some good races up my sleeve. And I believe now was the time. Uh, so I was starting to have this thought um, late last year that um, 2019 should be my last um, swim season. So I've known it for a long time, uh, but I've still worked like hard this year to kind of still get some, some good results in. In a hypothetical world, were you hoping to go to Kona again and then call it a day after the Ironman World Championships? Yeah, so um, the plan was to do Ironman Copenhagen um, as my last professional race on home soil. Uh, unfortunately, a month before Ironman Copenhagen, I got a stress reaction in my shin. And yeah, I'm still not running on it. We're now six weeks after that. So it was um, it was basically what you know decided that I could not race Ironman Copenhagen. And at Ironman Copenhagen, I had obviously hoped and believed that I would qualify for Kona and yes, race over there one last time. What was it like? So uh, that was not, uh, yeah, that was not, the, that was not to be. And, you know, I don't think it's going to be the first time in life where you're not planning that fairy tale ending. Um, so as I said a little while ago, I, yeah, I, I wanted to plan when I wanted to stop. And when it was that I kind of, um, digested and got over uh, the initial reaction of that I actually had this stress reaction in my shin uh, you know you were sad and you're angry and all that time and I kind of asked myself should I you know should I get over this uh, little bump on the road and then kind of find another Ironman this year to kind of finish off at a race and I was like what is what will it do to you to win another race? And I was couldn't really say other than, well, that would be nice. And I was like, could will it change your how great your career has been? And I was like, not really. So and that was why I decided to say like, well, enough is enough. This is this is the right time. This was the time you planned for. So that was why I didn't keep chasing after this little nickel or <laughs> injury in my leg. What was it like being at Ironman Copenhagen, knowing that that was the plan for the last race on home soil and, you know, having to watch from the sidelines? But they gave you an incredible reception as well, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was um, it was um, in the beginning, the thought of going there, I was like, no, I'm not going. But then I actually, you know, then I kind of decided I, I want to be there. And the decision of going there was the best thing I've done um, I was really really uh, content and clear of where I was now in my life when I was over there and just because I you know haven't been able to run or ride properly for the last month like leading into Copenhagen um, I was not ready to race right so I was standing on the sideline thinking whoa doing an Ironman today would be impossible kind of feeling <laughs> so uh, so that was actually quite nice that I just did not feel prepared for it because I wasn't prepared for it. Yep. Um, and then I was just, yeah, content in just watching from the sideline. And, and as you said, like they gave me a, a, a lot of recognition and like I started the race out there. I did a lot of media interview. They did like a big celebration um, at the finish line before the first finisher came uh, with some interviews. And yeah, and it was, it was great. It was, it was amazing. Um to get that um, finish line, it was kind of my finish line without having to do an Ironman before, but there was a finish line there. Uh, and it was all the Danes and yeah, all the spectators and I could say thank you for the support. And yeah, so that was great. It was it was really good that I did that. And it was, uh, it was quite, uh, it was a special moment, yeah. And a women's only professional race this year there. Were you still in the finish area to see Annie Haug come over the finish line and absolutely smash that race? <laughs> yeah, of course I was. I'm, I'm a fan of the sport. And of course I was kind of like, okay, so if I had been in the race, where would I have been there? And 
you know, how would this have played out? And of course, I'm seeing myself in because I well, I've raced so many years and I know the girls that they were racing. So I, you can never predict, but you still have a feeling of where you would have been. Um, so of course, I would I was there when anyhow came in and and also uh, the rest of the girls um, in the top. So um, yeah. <laughs> So this year, in terms of injuries and things like that, how hard has it been compared to, let's go to 2015, where it just sounded yeah. like a total nightmare? Yeah, well, so 2015 has been the worst period in my career, uh, injury-wise, because I came off 2014 being the most winning female triathlete in the world uh, and kind of winning everything and feeling that I kind of figured out the recipe of yeah winning how I should do it and also even I started 2015 really well with with some wins and yeah from one day to another actually uh, I got injured in my knee after seeing a a therapist um, which did something that he shouldn't have done probably also on top of that maybe my body needed rest you never really know why you get injured right it's, it's often a combination of a lot of things but saying that it took me one and a half year to get back to racing again and yeah that racing shape that I got back to was not racing shape but the the triathlete hill flex that I got back to was not as strong as the one she was earlier and that took me another year to actually get back to where I were before the injuries. It took me like two and a half years to get back to that. That was tough, very, very tough also because it was not early in my career. Um, so, of course, yeah, I did think about, is this the end or am I ever going to come back? Or And do I really want to keep pushing because it was mentally tough as well, uh, other than it was physically tough and I was in pain and I was atrophy in my legs, like my... My right quad was seven centimeters smaller than the left, and I was really, it was bad. That, I would say, is definitely the worst period, as I said. And this year, nowhere near as bad (laughs) as 15. This was just a little bump on the road, and I have been pretty, pretty healthy ever since, really, ever since, I would say, 17. Uh, Of course, you always get some injuries but I mean like if it only takes a few months for me it does it's not a big deal (laughs) where (laughs) two and a half years a big deal (laughs) just a little bit a lot can happen two and a half years what Uh, what did keep you going you've uh, you know you've you've talked before about finding your why and finding your reason for doing it but Mm. those days where you just thought why am I even gonna bother getting up this morning you know how did you how did you manage with all that yeah, like I felt that I was, that I really had so much more in me that I was far from done. And I, I felt I still had so much to show myself and so much to achieve. And that was what kept me going also because I, I got injured where I was literally, I was, and I was also feeling on top of the world. Like I was really racing well and I was taking away from that. So I just needed to get back to that person again and that feeling of winning and and actually it, it being able to achieve some some big achievements I needed that I could not stop with kind of like oh well that's fine it was just not right so I needed to at least you know give my very best to try and get back and not just accept a defeat like that um, so that was why I kept pushing I remember speaking to Lindsay Corbin and she yeah. faced a long time out as well. Yeah. yeah. D- you know, d- do you, when you, when you are injured and you are on out for, you know, well over a year, yeah. do you pick the brains of, of other triathletes like that who you know have been through similar just to have a bit of understanding from someone else to know that, you know, you're not going mad and that you can come back from it? Mm. Actually, Lindsay, I actually spoke quite a lot with her because it was a similar period that we were out. Okay. Uh, and hers also took a long time and she thought she was getting back, but it did not want to heal. And so, and I feel from 
from my experience, I felt like people has reached out to me. Um, the the other girls that have been similar situations. So I really feel that yeah, a lot of the yeah the in, like it's my colleagues really. They reach out and want the best for you, and that's also what makes triathlon amazing. Um, yeah, that that people really want the best for each other, and so I definitely. Um, you know talked a lot with with the other athletes and also to kind of reassure me that you just got to keep patient and you will come back eventually even though how bad it looks and and yeah and, and it's true and i mean i have also given that you know to other athletes later on um and i and i feel that it they, it has inspired me and i know that i can inspire and motivate others to kind of keep digging and keep believing because it does sound a little, a little bit cliche, but but it is really the truth. Um, and I mean, when it is that you get out of this period that seems like the end of the world, it really, really takes a lot um, of bad luck and the bad uh, things to happen to you for you to kind of give up and not get up on your feet again. So it makes you really, really strong and it makes you very, very good to put things into perspective to kind of say like, okay, it's not that bad, is it? Yeah. I'll get through it. And uh, I mean, like also now reflecting back on, on my career and it is that you have, I have got so many tools and so much mental strength from being a professional athlete that many years that, yeah, that, that I really feel it's, it's, it's really made me strong and robust for whatever life is going to throw at me. Um, yeah. And I guess I was going to say when you were just saying that about it can't be really, you know, that bad. I guess someone like your fellow countrywoman, Camilla Pedersen, what she did to get back as well. You look at that and you're like, mm, OK, exactly. you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing where people are saying you, you might not walk again and but all these things, right, and how, you know, if you're strong enough, if you want it badly enough and you do all your homework and all the small little things, all the rehab, core work, whatever work you got to do, you will come back again. And I think that is, it's not only, you know, it, it's, it's really for yourself and also to show yourself what you're capable of in, in, the, in the long picture or in your life, right, that you are capable of so much more than you think. Yeah. It just takes hard work. Nothing is is given to you, and nothing just comes falling down a tree down your head, right? You gotta work for it. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that the consistency and all of the hard work is what effectively made you pretty invincible and, and really so consistent on race day? Yeah, I think so. Like, it, it takes many many years to to create a champion right you you really need the patience you really need the consistent work and it i mean i started in the sport really in 2005 and went professional in 2009 and it almost took me right 10 years to well when i became world champion last year but also like i was in 14 where i had the the amazing amazing season i've been like five or six years as a professional at that point um, so it takes time and it takes, you know, you got to put layer on layer on top of each other and it doesn't really seem like much day to day, but that's not the purpose. You need to kind of understand that you need to replicate and be consistent day in and day out. And there's no session that's more important than the session tomorrow. It's really all about patience to achieve those big goals. And I definitely believe that all the small things that I have do, done through my whole career and all the prehab and core work and strength work and being patient has really, really paid off. Because I started late as well. Like, I was not young when I started to happen. And, and uh, I mean, and I've had my share of injuries and bad luck through my career, but uh, all the time come back stronger. Again, it sounds really cliche, but it is the truth. And that is really because I've done all the small little things right, and I've been patient. Um, and it's it's definitely also easier for me now to see those things when I'm not sitting in the middle of it. Yes. Yeah. I'm on the other side right now, so I'm able to put a lot of things in perspective, and I'm able to kind of look in on myself and what I've actually done. 
do you think that you have celebrated the spent long enough celebrating you know the real highs no <laughs> um i think it's typical for like elite athlete that's striving to become better and better and better and better every single day and we need to you know we need to not be content with a great result and then say okay i'm, I'm happy now like because then you are not trying to get become better but for sure like um we we have well, uh, it would be good for you to tap yourself on the back and kind of saying this was amazing you became world champion last yesterday or you ran so so fast running off the bike that you've never done before like you have done great it was amazing performance but you're more like next morning okay um we're gonna plan for next race it's in three weeks okay <laughs> it's just typical <laughs> i mean but but you're doing the same thing like if i had a bad race or a bad session then i will kind of sit down or write down evaluate the whole race saying okay what went wrong what went, what what went, went well and okay this i'm not gonna do again maybe i came into the race one day too late or maybe if I did, I shouldn't have done that session the day before. I'll never do that again then because that was probably the reason why I did not swim well. Or, you know, so yeah. we keep evaluating all the time and we keep like learning from yeah mistakes, but also we we never dwell and we never ever uh, yeah as you said, do you celebrate enough? Probably not. You mm. probably don't celebrate before you're really done. <laughs> have you have you had a little celebration over the past couple of weeks a big celebration yeah i have and, and i'm actually uh, purposely on a vacation um, at home but i am not haven't planned a million things and i'm really taking day by day and chilling i'm training a bit but then i also just resting and seeing a lot of family and friends and it's that is really really nice and not having to you know, do all the training every single day and having to go to bed early and having to get up early and it's okay to to yeah, you not not follow that structure that you normally that you've had for the last forever. More or less. <laughs> That's forever. Did you uh, <laughs> have you did you were you able to turn your alarm clock off or did your body clock just wake you up naturally? <laughs> Yeah, it still wakes me up. <laughs> oh, yeah, it still does. I'm like, come on. I don't need to get up by 30. You can sleep just a little longer. <laughs> so, no, it's still there. Also, if I get to bed very late, I'm still up that early. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> it takes longer time. <laughs> I'm still going to have to be going to bed at half past eight. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's just, it's been so many years. Well, I was um, I was an elite swimmer, national yeah. swimmer. Um, also, when I was young, I uh, got on the national team in swimming when I was 12. So, I mean, like, it's been my whole life uh, being endurance elite athlete. Um, so, I mean, the body doesn't know any different. Uh, and it, it the, the brain might understand what's going on, but the body, especially in the beginning, um, now it's been yeah six weeks where I haven't trained as a professional athlete and in the beginning it was completely couldn't figure out what was going on the body uh, really reacting to it and found it very like I was not feeling well like body wise because it was like ah we need to get out and train like I need this stimuli every single day or else yeah I was getting yeah not feeling well in my body yeah. Uh, but the brain was like, relax, you don't need to, it's fine. You can just relax and actually quite nice. And the body on the other side, no, <laughs> I need this. <laughs> so that was it's getting much better now. And we're kind of starting to, the body and mind is starting to agree on the situation. Yeah. <laughs> so that's much better. <laughs> is there any yeah. part of retirement that does scare you and having to make the transition from doing what you've known and then into the unknown yeah like i mean um right now it's okay but i've been used to obviously working towards a purpose every mm. single day or like a big goal and of often a physical goal that's how i structure my everyday life and it's always been like it almost always been like that 
now to find that why or that big, big goal that you're working towards that is challenging, it motivates you, it challenges you, yeah, and that those things or that is probably um, is will probably be the hardest right now. As I say, I'm still enjoying just taking day by day and actually not having a purpose. Mm -hmm. But I think that very soon I need to find what is the next goal because that's the way I operate. Um, so I think that that will probably be the hardest thing to to find that big goal that is really uh, you know getting me out of bed and really motivates me to to work hard because mm -hmm. I I need to to not you know work hard like that but have something that is difficult to achieve and something that requires the best of me not physically but the best of me in whatever I can do also um, you know with my brain and and with my whatever I can, I, I can do with my like education and experience and all those things those that thing I think could be will probably be the hardest but I think that um I'm very sure it will come down the line, and that's also why, as I said, I haven't made a plan because I and I because I think it's healthy for me to have time to digest it all, celebrate, relax, <laughs> and just pull the plug for a little while, and then just like get the body down in some sort of uh, normal speed. <laughs> <laughs> not not 110 miles an hour all the time. No, exactly. Or five or six hours of training every day, like where your body's just trying to recover, like. Yeah. I think it's important that you you pull yourself back and actually, of course, you I'm training more than a normal person, but yeah. um, but still, you know, training to be healthy yeah. instead of training to become one of the best in the world. Um, it's a different way. It's a different way of kind of yeah using training. Using would you is there any part of you that would be tempted you said about that that next sort of challenge and the goal mm -hmm. and things to go and do the phd that you actually didn't go and do a number of years ago yeah i have thought about it and i have been looking into it yes really <laughs> yeah i was uh, i was thinking what possibilities there are but it has to be in an area that really excites me um at the moment so i need to find the right thing but it is possible to go back and it is it is um of course you are you know you, you you're working or you're working towards becoming a professor but it is also a job right so yeah. um so it is it's, it's different way it's not like studying like i did um so it, it could be uh, it could be something that i could do um and then i'm also actually um yeah i'm writing a book yeah My, have you started yeah. it um, I actually have the meeting with the editor next week. Okay. Um, so, um, oh, no, when I get, I'm going to Nice. So when I get back from Nice, we have the meeting. Um, I'm going down for the 70 point three walls. Yeah. Not racing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did qualify though, but I'm not racing. <laughs> you could just rock up and go. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> you don't think you rock up to a world championship. No. Yes. <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, so, so I'll be spending a lot. We are, we are going to publish it, uh, or it's going to come out in the spring next year. So that will take a lot of time here in the fall and during the uh, yeah Christmas winter time. So you haven't um, yet had um, writer's block. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's uh, I think it. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> I think it will be a great process. I think it will be a great book for sure. But I also think it will be good for me. Yeah. Uh, to get through the whole um, career and that person that's behind, you know, uh, all these results and all these the, that is adventure, more or less, I've been on. During your career, there's obviously things that you know haven't gone to plan, and you you know have failed at. What would you say that you have learned most from? any of those failures is there, is there one in particular that stands out and you'd say actually that is what I learned most from oh that's a good question um I would probably say I learned most from that long injury that I got in 2015 mm -hmm. because it was that long and it was so long time where I had to kind of keep convincing myself and keep um reassuring myself that I will come back and 
the reason why I'm doing this is strong enough for me to um, yeah, keep keep getting up and doing the small things right every single day to come back to the level that I left. Um, I think uh, in, in that period I learned the most because it was not just like a two or three months injury. It was one and a half year. Mm. Um, so that was where I learned the most in being just yeah, you know, really learning what does perseverance mean um, at that point. I, I guess that's going to be a big chapter in the book. <laughs> yeah, it, it will be. And I think like I've, I've also said many times, like it really, what defines you as a champion is really how you get out of your defeat and how you get on your, on your, on your feet again. You know, you, there are many highs in the career, but there are often more lows than there are highs. Uh, and I think that the greatest champion has been through a lot of lows. Uh, there is nowhere, no one that's went straight to the top. Um, and it's been taking a long, long, long time to get there. So there's no doubt about it that there will be a lot of, um, there will be a lot of stories about some of the, some of the hard times, all the hardship, because there are a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but that also makes the great times even better. I tell you some of the finish lines I've had after coming back uh, in 2017. It's 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 the wildest thing. It's the best thing because you relive all the hard stuff you've been through and all the the doubts and frustration and the tears when it suddenly succeeds again and you're suddenly yourself and you're suddenly you know performing and feeling that flow of like you know what you are capable of with your body it's it's absolutely amazing and then it's it's worth every single minute of where you've been you know biting in the grass and lying under the couch and crying right <laughs> which is kind of what happens you know just when you do get injured and you realize that there's a problem it's uh yeah, as I said in the beginning, I would do it all over again. If I was 25 years old, I would do it all over again. <laughs> Hello, I'm welling up. Is is there one finish line that stands out? <clears throat> yeah, um, not one, but the the biggest one in recent time uh, was the ITU Long Distance World Championship last year where, so Ben and I has have been my husband and I have been coaching me for the last one and two and a half year uh, just the two of us and of course it takes a little bit of time to trust yourself and when it is that you are planning your own training and your own structure and your own season plan but there at Worlds everything just clicked and I was racing amazingly and then having been on the other side of the finish line there, you know, crying and I was crying and it was our project together. Only the two of us, that was, that was wild. That was really wild. And then having all the Danes, it was in Denmark, right? And yeah. with the Danish flag above my head and no, that was crazy. I want to, I want to cry again now, Helen. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't think I'm the most emotional person, but I'm like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty special thing to have you with your husband. I tell you that there was, uh, and you know, family and friends, and I was seeing through the last kilometers. I was running towards the finish line. That I was, I had two and a half minutes to the the next girl, Barbara Rivers, yep. and uh, and I was seeing so many of my friends and family with tears in their eyes and. Oh, that was crazy. <laughs> now I get goosebumps. <laughs> and like, you were just crying. Like, it was just, they, were just, they just wanted it for me. They just wanted me to win at home. So they knew what I've been going through. And they knew that we were doing this together. And, you know, performing at home at Worlds where the pressure is the highest and you want the most and the media are there. And yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, two questions. <laughs> One from Shane. It says, Heather runs like a gazelle. What does she focus on technique-wise and strength and conditioning-wise to run like that? Yeah, so I've been lucky that I have never really, this is how I've always run, so I haven't really had to learn to run like this. Um, 
but I do work a lot of core and hip and glute activation work. Um, I focus a lot on kind of like, um, so when I land on one leg that I don't, that I'm strong enough in now being a little bit technical, mm. glute medius, yep. um, so that you don't have, fall, your hip doesn't fall out, but you keep uh, in a strong straight line. Yep. Um, and I really think about, you know, activating glute abdominal being strong uh, so that you don't sit down and run if you know what I mean like but yep. you keep on tall nice and tall I think about that and then I think about um, keeping the cadence uh, up yep. and not um, uh, get your feet off the ground quickly so like I always think when I have my foot on the ground I'm breaking the speed so just get it off the ground quickly again um, yeah that's what goes through my mind and then uh, if I'm not in a hard session, I'm trying to enjoy the nature. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with your strength and conditioning, how much would, like, how much would you do in your program? And what would you say would be, you know, should a, a typical age grouper try to do, try to incorporate yeah. some in their in their program? Yeah, I, I would say. I, I try to get three times a weekend at around 40 minutes, 45 minutes. I would say for a typical age grouper, if you can get in two times a week between 30 and 40 minutes where you are efficient, it doesn't need to go to a gym. Just have some, some you know, a good mat and, and some small weights and some bands, band work. You're fine at home to so just quickly, I mean, like we can all find 30, 40 minutes to just jump on the on the living room floor and then get some, uh, core work, activation work, uh, prehab work in. I think it is really, really important. And I think it, if we can do that sort of work, we are able to, you know, be more efficient when we swim, bike, and run, and you know, can carry yourself under fatigue in a more efficient way. If it is that we spend time uh, doing our, yeah, all almost call it homework. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes it's better to get that sort of session done than going for that, um, I don't know, another little swim, bike or run session. Um, I think it's important that we prioritize our strength and uh, and prehab work, especially as you get older. Um, and you also find that a lot of athletes that hasn't really been injured a lot, then suddenly they're rolling into injuries. They're starting to do all this strength training and they're like, oh, I should have started way before. But it's often like, you know, it's often with those people, it's like you can't tell them, you know, I think it's a good idea you do this as, as, a, as a, you know, prevention of injuries yep. because, well, why should I before it's too, before <laughs> it all it. happened? And that, yeah, and then it's like, you know, that's the thing about you have to make your own mistakes before you learn right yeah before you understand yeah you can you can advise and you can say what you think will be good for you but often you need to feel it on your body to say okay i should have done it i'm gonna do it from now on <laughs> <laughs> so typical so typical <laughs> yeah it is it is but that's just how it is how we are <laughs> And Laura Kate Ongaro, she was actually, she did Ironman Copenhagen and um, she says, how on earth can we all learn to swim like you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, swimming is, is, is a technical discipline. Yep. I've been swimming since I was five years old. Um, so, uh, I mean, frequency in the water, get in the water also, you know, if you only have 30 minutes, it's better than nothing. Uh, that that is probably the the most important thing to be get in the water. If you can get in the water three times a week, you will be able to really progress your swimming. And then have someone to to watch you if you're swimming alone. Have someone to to watch you for a little while so that you not you're not incorporating a lot of small mistakes uh, when it is that you swim because you think you look like something. You think mm -hmm. you're doing it right. But often the case is you are actually not, or that there's you you're doing having some little mistake or some little habit that you think is the right thing, but it's not. So get someone to watch you, film you, and then you know incorporate a good 
pattern, movement, movement pattern, and habits in the pool. Um, I think that that is probably two big things to become a good swimmer. And would and you say that understanding and under also understanding that's a big difference between pool swimming and open water swimming. So like being a swimmer or being a triathlete swimmer. Um, that when it is that we do swim open water, it's not at all about looking beautiful and having a nice glidey stroke. It's just really about taking your space in the water, be assertive, be aggressive, take your, you know, I mean, get your freaking cadence up in your arms and then work on whatever happens underneath the water, over the water, doesn't matter. Just get them around underneath the water again. Um, we are not swimming in a nice lane, you know, with lane ropes. When if you touch each other, you will say, oh, "I'm sorry," in a pool. <laughs> <laughs> Where triathletes, it's like they'll just swim over you if that's the shortest way, right? <laughs> yep. So um, yeah, so that's different. That it's two different things. I like that. <laughs> and be I aggressive. That's the hard way. And be yeah. assertive. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And yes. would you say, Helen, that three times a week for half an hour is better than once a week for an hour and a half? Yes, absolutely. Because you can also keep your technique up for that half an hour where often if you're swimming one and a half hour, it will, your technique will maybe, because you're tired, yep. you won't be able to hold yourself for one and a half hour. So the last hour, 45 minutes will be a waste of time anyway. There you go. Make it Make it all count. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For 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 yeah. But for all of us, like it's just no fluff. Just you know, most of, uh, of course, the professionals, but also you know, most of the age groupers, uh, they have a full time job and and they are doing triathlon because they want to achieve a goal, and they they ob- they don't they don't want to have or they don't have time for for fluff or just hanging around or just. Um, you know, going for a swim, just to go for a swim. They are going for a swim because they have a race coming up that they would like to do well at. Um, so definitely make the time count. And are you going to be doing a little bit more coaching now, Hella? Yeah, yeah, I will. I've already taken a few more in. Uh, I have coached the last oh, 11 years now, um, but only like a good handful. Uh, and now I'm, I'm opening up for some more. I've already, as I said, already have a few more in or a handful more in uh, and I will be doing a little bit more I enjoy I really enjoy uh, um, helping people to achieve goals but like in the sport but also often it goes hand in hand with uh, achieving goals in a personal life as well work life um, getting more confidence um, you often see that and it's almost uh, or oh, it's it's equally important to me to see that um, of, often people can almost transform to a way stronger version of themselves also in their personal life and that is something that really touches me when I see that Hello, good luck with everything I think you're going to have an amazing retirement and an amazing next chapter of life <laughs> so enjoy it and yeah, best of luck with it all Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Rob, once again, another professional, another athlete, another amazing person saying, talking about the importance of consistency and consistency being key towards success. Yeah. What's that phrase? It's not easy, but it is simple. Yeah. Keep on training. Keep on training. Yeah, it's good. I'd be interested yeah. to see, uh, that I think her book will make an interesting read. When that I think her book out. will be great. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. Really cool. Because she's got obviously lots of time and so much, I mean, like lots of time to give to others is what I mean. And it's just so much experience. Yeah. Good. Yeah. She's seen it. Been there, done that. All right. Coach's couch this week, Hells. Yeah. Now, Rob, this is interesting because I'm in Wales is coming up this weekend. Sure Very much is. looking forward to it being down there you're going to be super um, supporter aren't you you're going to be super supporter and and um, we'll talk in a tiny bit about the the other event that i'm involved in but now rob i was doing what if i was going to be racing i would be doing a lot more which was checking the weather yeah oh my god at the moment it's like wall-to-wall sunshine <laughs> Don't Not curse joking. it. Don't curse it, Els. 
honestly, <laughs> in a, I was just like, wow, that is not what we got two years ago or yeah. three years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. No, seriously. Well, we need so to talk this, a little bit about thing. weather, I think, don't we, for Wales? Because it's whale, uh, the weather there is the, is the fourth discipline. No question. It is. Oh, anyway, the question is, tips for riding the Ironman Wales course so you can still run well afterwards. Right, so the key here is obviously everyone who's going to do this knows this fact already. The Ironman Wales course is extremely hilly. There's not very much flat on it at all. It's mostly going uphill or downhill. And it's a beautiful, beautiful bike course from a enjoying the scenery point of view. But you're not going to get to see a lot of the scenery because you're going to be concentrating a lot. So the first tip I've got for people is most people are going to be at least 30 minutes slower than they would be on a fast Ironman course. And this is really important because we can't go with like a standard ride at this percentage of FTP especially if, if if athletes have been reading about what better age groupers or pros ride in terms of the percentage of FTP. The real key thing to take on here is the longer that you're out on a bike course, the lower the percentage of your FTP or in easy terms, the slower and easier you're going to have to ride. Because obviously, if you're out on a bike course for four hours, you can put out a certain percentage of effort. If you're going to be out there for seven hours, you've got to put out relatively a smaller percentage of effort. So, If you've got a power meter, then this becomes a little bit easier. If not, that's fine as well. We'll go through ways you can do this with heart rate or even just perceived exertion. But in general, we need you to understand about TSS score, so training stress score. We're going to be looking to finish the bike course with about 280 TSS points. So that's regardless of how long you're going to be out there for. So again, we're going to take the example of if you are an athlete who's covering a course in four hours, you can obviously go much harder and accumulate the 280 TSS points in a shorter period of time. Because you're going to be out there for longer, you're going to have to go at relatively a lower percentage of effort. You're going to be somewhere in the region of 60 to 70% of FTP, and most age groupers are going to be at the lower end of that. There's a great software package called Best Bike Split, and it's well worth going on there. What they can do for you is for free, they can give you an accurate power guidance set. So you, you upload the, the Ironman Wales bike course into it, you tell it your various metrics, and it will then give you the, the basically like a power navigation thing. As you ride around the course, it's going to tell you how hard to go up each hill. But in general, whatever your percentage of FTP is that you're going to ride the whole course at on average, allow yourself 10% extra on the uphills and 10% less on the downhills. So this is hard, isn't it, Alice? Because most of the course you're going to be going either uphill or downhill. Some of these yeah. downhills, you're just going to be spinning your spinning your, um, your cranks and not putting out any power. But on the longer, steadier uphills, allow yourself a 10% extra. So let's say your target was 60%, allow yourself to go to 70%. The key here is feel like you're holding yourself back the whole time. Cap yourself at whatever your 100% of FTP is on the really steep hills like on Saunders Foot because it's going to be really easy when you're surrounded by super enthusiastic athletes to go really, really hard over those hills. More, and... more like super enthusiastic supporters. Yes, that's that bit. too. <laughs> that's the bit. That's you the feel thing, invincible going up there and that is that is, it's not really the other people around you. It's more the people on the sidelines yeah. cheering you on egging you on going you know come on dig in a bit more get up that hill and the adrenaline is going to make that yes. feel a lot easier than the power meter actually says it feels <laughs> so try and hold yourself back a bit ride within yourself on the uphills and even if you're just riding with heart rate set your garmin to show tss score as you're rolling along and you can kind of check in with yourself then get to the 45k marker you should have accumulated about 70 tss points and if you're a bit above that you need to go up a gear and ease yourself back again check at 90k you should have accumulated about 140 tss points again if you're a bit above it back yourself off a little bit and the whole time we want you riding with the run in mind you've just got to back yourself off a little bit because Let's be honest, Hells, it's not an easy marathon, is it? And you're going to need your legs for that hilly marathon as well. That run is something else. Again, it yeah. is something else. It's Blimey. all uphill and downhill, isn't it, the whole way? 
Yeah, and I, I don't think I, I don't, I really didn't appreciate quite how hilly it was going to be. Yeah, it's um, and and that's the one thing that I'll say to people, especially if it's your first time. Remember that an Ironman is effectively riding your bike for six or seven hours as a warm up to the start line of your local marathon. And at Wales, your local marathon is extremely hilly. And if you treat the bike ride like that the whole way, this is a warm up to run a marathon. That puts you in the right mindset, I think. If you go into it thinking every hill's like the Tour de France and the person next to you is Chris Froome and you're trying to beat them to the top of the hill, you're looking at a <laughs> oh, long, that marathon's sore gonna be fun. marathon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Great support, I, um... though, all the way through, isn't it, Hells? The, the village itself of Tembe is lined two or three deep pretty much the whole way round. Uh, yeah 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 it is it is incredible and then as you progress on the run so the supporters and well let's say more maybe the locals are getting more and more more drunk (laughs) yeah very much more merry so the bit through the town center you know at the beginning they're just like oh come on you know by the fourth lap (laughs) just telling you how amazing you are and everything Uh, and they're very very jolly by that fourth lap so yeah if you are racing go and enjoy it have a ball it is something pretty special racing at ironman wales pace it definitely pace it um and yeah it's just the whole experience i think is on completely another level it sure is and i will be there i will be cheering people on um definitely out on the course on sunday so i will supporter will be there and also you've got something else going on as well haven't you but we're going to come to that in just a minute First up, shout out to sponsors Team Oxygen Addict. We offer coaching for all triathlon running and cycling events for everyone from total beginners to Kona qualifiers. And we've even offered what we even offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're interested in how coaching with Team OA and the time training system will help you improve, you can book a free coaching consultation with me over Skype. There's a link in the show notes. Pop your email address in there and I'll email you to work out a time that works for both of us. There's also a link to download our free analyzing your race performance document that's going to help you review your own race in a way that we do within the team. This week, we're going to hear a quick catch up from coach team member Natalie Duncan about her coaching experience with the team. Hi, my name's Natalie and I've been a member of Team Oxygen Addict since October 2018. And I joined after completing my first GB age group event. I was a self-coached athlete um, in the lead up to that race, so I wrote my own um, run bike training programs, Um, but I found it really time consuming and stressful um, and it sort of started to take away the excitement and enjoyment of training for me. Um, I also was really struggling to fit in and recover from the volume and intensity of training that I thought I needed to be doing to improve, um, which meant that I was exhausted all of the time. And thirdly, the improvements that I been making had started to become marginal and I knew I didn't have the knowledge to be able to do anything differently to make me any better. Um, So I joined the team and I've been following Rob's coaching methodologies for the past six months now Um, and one of the big differences that I've noticed um, is that the focus of the OA um, training methodology is very much around making you a better multi-sport athlete Um, and not necessarily making you the best runner, swimmer or cyclist. Um, And I think that's a common problem that a lot of us um, self-coached age groupers face. So that's been really valuable um, in changing my attitude and approach to training. Um, A couple of the differences that I've noticed um, with what um, Rob's training plans look like compared to what I've been used to doing before. Um, is the focus of intensity on the bike. So there's some really key quality structured bike sessions that feature every week um, and they've been invaluable in improving my strength and confidence out on the road. Um, And that has been reflected in the improvements that I've seen in my FTP. So my FTP has gone up um, just short of 20% in the past six months, which I'm really pleased with. Um, One of the other differences is the approach to the long run. So... um, The long run is usually a combination of running and walking, which was really difficult for my ego to get over. Um, But after a couple of training sessions, that's actually become a really enjoyable session in the week. Um, And it's certainly improved my robustness as a runner so I can run further um, with better form um, and not need so long to recover every week, which is great um, and certainly helps with the exhaustion problems that I was having before. Um, 
recovery is a really big improvement that I've seen since following this training plan. Um, I recover much quicker throughout the week. I need fewer rest days and my recovery from races is vastly improved. Um, and I think one of the other things that I was um, concerned about um, was the absence of fast running um, and that combined with the run walk approach to the long run. I couldn't see how I was going to get any faster, but um, I've certainly been proved wrong. Um, this time last year, my 5k time was just short of 20 minutes um, and I I'm now within touching distance of running a 19 minute or faster 5k so um, that's been great. Um, so I'm training fewer hours across more days, um, less intensity and my improvements have uh, or my performance improvements have gone up significantly um, and I'm feeling fitter and faster and more mentally prepared and I just hope that all of the hard work pays off on race day. All right Hells, so we want to hear all about the Women for Try meetup that you're going to be part of. Dan, I'm on Wales, please. Yeah, so if you are racing in Tembe or you're supporting in Tembe and you're there on Friday evening, then come along to the De Valance Pavilion at six o'clock for a Women for Try panel and meet up so laura siddle is going to be on the panel simone mitchell who we had on the podcast last week she will be on the panel i'm gonna be there co-hosting it with joe murphy who is the ironman announcer at ironman wales lindsay patterson who is the regional women for try ambassador she's going to be there so opportunities to ask loads of questions pick the brains of simone and laura there'll be freebies so it's going to be cool Men are nice. very much encouraged to come as well. So it's not just for women. It's about encouraging um, women, of course. But yeah, guys, you can come too. So come along. The Valance to hear some, some pros and some wisdom before the race, hey? Correct. De Valance Pavilion, 6 till 7 on Friday, the 13th of September. Cool stuff. So shout out here for our sponsors, Precision Hydration. Remember, you guys can get over to precisionhydration.com and take their free online sweat test if you haven't done so already. That'll give you a really good lead as to whether you are a particularly salty or heavy sweater because Precision Hydration make hydration salts in different strengths to match how you sweat. So they've got everything from 250 milligrams for you lighter sweaters all the way through to 1500 milligrams for crazy, um, super salty sweaters like me or really heavy sweaters as well. So the key is to have the right balance of electrolytes to replace the electrolytes that you're losing during sweat. And if it turns out that you are an especially heavy or salty sweater, you can even see them for an in-person sweat test and find out exactly how much um, sodium you're losing in your sweat. So you can get over and check it out, precisionhydration.com. And if you've never tried them before, you can use the code OxygenAddict to get £9.99's worth of free pH as a risk-free trial. Right, Hells, other things we've seen going on in news as well. Tokyo 2020. Yeah, well, Rob, you know, anytime an Olympic Games comes around and there are maybe like maybe London was an exception, but, you know, there's things like the open water swim or triathlon. Then there are often questions over the water quality. And this is no different for Tokyo. Scientists are saying that organisers should abandon the one of the swimming venues because it is dangerously, dangerously polluted that's with good, human waste but That's um good. well no not good and in you know back in august at the test event the para try the swim section was cancelled after e coli was measured at twice the permitted level in that water yeah not good um not good but a spokesman for the game says you know we conduct checks together with medical doctors to secure the safety of athletes we have no thoughts at all about changing the venue so i think that one will probably rumble on and on until games along with yeah. is it ready is it not ready um, another be thing damned, hey. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah totally. the water smells like a toilet no no it's fine you're gonna be all it's right fine. jump it's in fine. guys <laughs> yeah um 
Do you remember back in April, I went to an event at the National Insurance Centre in Leeds and spoke to Malcolm Brown and Jack Maitland and Johnny Brownlee and Beth Potter was there as well. Well, they are running another improving performance in endurance sport event. This time it's on the 13th of October. Uh, Jack Maitland's going to be there, Kirsten Stephenson, Josh Rowe, or Joshua Rowe, and then a couple more guests. So Malcolm Brown and Andy Drake will be hosting it. I really enjoyed it last time, learnt loads, took a lot from it. So it's if you're into coaching, it's really good. If you're an athlete and you want to learn more, again, it's a really fantastic day. So head to nationalendurancecentre.co.uk to find out more. 13th of October in Leeds. Awesome stuff. All right, let's wrap this up then. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week with our Ironman Wales special. Best of luck to anybody who's racing at Ironman Wales this coming weekend. We've been brought to you by our sponsors, foodcell.co.uk, precisionhydration.com, and teamoxygenetic.com. And we'll be back next week with Hells, your super duper interviews. If you're at Wales, give Hells a shout as you go by. She'll be jumping up and down like a lunatic, won't you, Helen? Correct. <laughs> I've been in training. I've been doing a lot of training for this. You've so. been practicing your cheering. I love it. I've been practicing my cheering. cheering so, yeah, I am ready. Great. <laughs> love it. <laughs> All right, everybody, till next week, have a great safe training and racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. You've been listening to the Oxygenetic Triathlon Podcast. We'll speak to you all again soon. Have a great safe week, everyone. See ya.